Hello, my name's Emily Butler. I'm the curator of the Conversations program. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. I'm a little bit sad because this is the last talk in our series of conversations for Art Basel Miami Beach, but I'm also really thrilled because there's no better way to end the program than our discussion tonight. Um, the, uh, the person I'm introducing really needs no introduction. Um, we're so delighted to have on stage the internationally recognized, multi-talented singer-songwriter and, uh, and uh, supporter of creative talent in the arts, Chance the Rapper. <laughs> he will be discussing recent and upcoming projects, including the Black Star Line Gallery, with the Dynamic Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Queen's Museum in New York, Lauren Haynes. Thank you to all of Chance's team and all the team here at Basel who've made the event possible tonight. And we're really so grateful that you've taken the time to be with us uh, tonight. So there'll be time for questions at the end of the conversation, but please do join me in giving our speakers another huge round of applause and enjoy the conversation. Great, thank you so much, Emily, for that amazing introduction. Um, thank you all so much for being here on a Saturday late afternoon, evening. Um, we're excited. Same, yeah. Yeah. What? Who knows what time it is? <laughs> um, thank you also thank for being you. here. Really excited to have this conversation and chat. Um, and yeah, like Emily said, we're going to talk for a little bit, then we'll open up for questions. Um, so I think maybe we can start just with thinking about Starline Gallery, maybe that project, you want to talk to us a little bit about it and how it came about? Yeah, totally. Wow, where do I start? Um, yeah, so Starline Gallery is uh, a project I've been working on for a couple of years now. It's, uh, it's an interdisciplinary project that like bridges music and uh, the visual arts film and also uh, the fine arts, like tangible pieces. And in short, what I do is I, I forge a relationship with an artist, typically, and spend some time in conversation and in community. And then we pick a conversation that we've had to kind of try and uh, create across our two different mediums. You know, me making hot raps and and then making <laughs> fire art. And, uh, and then we uh, create a marriage between the, the, the physical and this auditory experience uh, in a film piece, typically like a music video. And I started on these, uh, on these pieces in 2022, I think. Uh, the first piece was a collaboration with this artist, Nilo Pianga. She's uh, a painter and architect from Gabon, uh, Africa. And we met in Ghana and headed off immediately. She kind of took care of me on my first trip to Ghana, uh, showed me around the place, taught me um, the incredibly important history of Ghana when it comes to uh, global black liberation. It's, it was the first country in West Africa uh, or in Sub-Saharan Africa period to gain its independence from colonialism. and. Uh, and her being like, you know, uh, a, f a Francophone African, she has like a very, very uh, nuanced understanding of like arts, yeah. commodification, everything. And uh, we just had some really deep conversations. And we ended up uh, creating a piece together called Child of God. Uh, it opened up at the MCA last year. And... Uh, and that was the first time that I really collaborated with a visual artist like that. And it, it really taught me that I could learn a lot from being in conversation with them and that my art could be better understood when I'm in community with them. And yeah, I'm sorry if I just talked for too long. That was a yeah. long answer. My that was bad. great. That was a great answer. What are you looking for in those partners and that collaboration? Like, you know, is it really that amazing first conversation where you're like, oh, wait, we could actually keep talking, keep working together. How does it really start? Yeah, I think that's like one of the biggest things is creating the relationship first. Um, and so with all the artists that I've worked with, they've all been black people from around the world. Um, 
a, a lot of American black artists, but also artists from other countries. And, uh, and, and I think I'm, I be just, I, I, I am trying to learn. Yeah. I be trying to learn too. I don't know. I don't need to correct myself. Yeah. I be, I be and am, yeah. uh, trying to learn. And there's just so much stuff that I don't know. And so I think in my first trip to Ghana, I got introduced to Otis Cueco and um, and uh, Amwako and uh, a bunch of bunch of dope artists and photographers as well. And and that was like my first time being like, oh yeah, like I could be gang with black people anywhere. Then I went to the Venice Biennale and my experience there, like really solidified the idea that I could be gang with black people anywhere. Cause these were black people from everywhere. Yeah. And we just immediately like coagulated and became like, you know, a really solid group of friends. I made a lot of what I hope to be li lifelong friends there. And, uh, and I really got to understand how much I have in common and how much I have to learn from people. And so in, in all of it, it's been a really organic experience. It's been, you know, laughs and going to the club and, you know, it's not always like, all right, what do you think about right. colonialism? Yeah, it's like more like, it's more like regular conversation. That's how I, I really wanted the project to come across. I don't, I, it is a very black project, but it's not something that's so like drenched in trauma. It's like, it's just like experience, it's life. And, and, uh, and there's a lot of people that I have to learn life from. Another long answer, I'm sorry. No, I love it. You're doing great. Um, so in thinking about, the you know, the project and the artists that you're choosing to work with and those conversations, what is the response when you reach out and sort of explain what you're working on and talk about what you are thinking and how it comes across and that you want them to make an object, make an artwork that's a response and part of this? They're usually like, what? Like, like I don't understand what you mean because it's such a like, Typically, like when an artist puts out a, a a body of work, there's always a visual representation, like an album cover, that becomes synonymous with the sound. But I've always felt like it kind of like reduces or like marginalizes the overall art because it, it, like, if you think about Thriller, you can remember the album cover, right? But like everybody that thought about Thriller probably thought about different songs, right? And so the pieces within the album sometimes need their own visual representation. So I started thinking a while ago that I wanted to do something like that. But coming to artists and being like, hey, I want to create a piece with you from scratch, from the ground up, and I want you to also own the piece. It's like a weird, like, it's a, it's all like a new thing. Yeah. And so I think it when it's somebody that I haven't like really worked with or known for a while, and I'm just reaching out to them, they're usually very confused. But a lot of people are down, and, and that's been a blessing. Yeah, I think it, for the artist, it's probably also just a really exciting thing to think about, right? A different way of approaching their work, their practice, and really having the interdisciplinary nature of it just really develop. So I feel like probably after that first sort of like, what? It's like, all right, let's, let's figure this out. Let's make this work. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like, uh, it's, it, it brings so many different, what's the right way to put this? Like, it's not a commission, right. right? It's not me saying, hey, this is what I want you to paint. It's me saying, hey, I have this idea, or I got this beat, or I got this thing that I've been thinking about, and I would love it if you could create alongside me uh, to help make this idea understood because some people are visual learners some people need to see uh, the work in visual form to understand it and i think when when we're doing it it feels like a new experience for both of us every time yeah. me too mm -hmm. and i think all the things that come with it afterwards is usually like i said we opened up child of god at mca um we opened up the highs and the lows at uh, do Savo, we opened up Bar About a Bar at the Art Institute, uh, y'all know at the MOCA, and um, some of these institutions, like, uh, uh, a lot of these are contemporary spaces, but 
we're trying to get to a point where we break down this wall between artists and and some of these uh these institutions yeah that where they're not a commodity where they're where the work is on lease from them and not a gallery and 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 it's a and it's a and it's their own thing and it's their own event and they bring people to the museum and that's been like a cool like i don't know just feel it's a it's a powerful feeling to come into those spaces and present new living art along with the living artists that create it and hey yeah it's been dope these photos are great too yeah it's really amazing to see no i definitely think you know there has been in the last i don't know 15 10 15 years an increased presence of black artists in many mainstream museums but not enough and particularly i think artists also at earlier stages in their career so really having a project that lets us happen on giving people agency, I think is really important and sort of speaks to, I think the power, one of the powerful parts of this project. Um, another part of this is also the film component and really thinking about how it continues to be interdisciplinary. Can you touch a little bit on that? Yeah, so being honest, the film thing is really what got me to being able to, to make these collaborations happen and also really got me back into music, to be honest. Uh, I was making music a little bit in 2020, but not really that much because there was a pandemic happening. And so I was not super motivated. And what happened was I started going down this like uh, YouTube click hole of like, I've always loved film since I was a kid. Like I, I really love movies, man. And, and, I and I love plays and shit too. And I love comedy. I'm from Chicago. So I used to do improv with Reese and like do random, you know, funny things. So I always loved film and comedy and, and just the, the group project element of film specifically, all the different departments coming together to make this one piece. I always thought that was so cool. And so one day I, I like did like a really deep YouTube essay dive of like how like the ins and outs of, of cinematography that's like one of my favorite things is like you know film composition and framing and like and pacing of an edit like i love like those three things coming together i feel like you can make a terrible movie great so i, I really got into that and i started wanting to do tests and uh and eventually after i did some tests i was like okay it would be dope to shoot a music video but I ain't really have no music, so I made a song so that I could shoot a video for it. And that one was called The Heart and the Tongue. And uh, I made that in, I think, at the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021. Uh, and then after that, I just got really into it. And I started buying a whole bunch of lenses and cameras and lighting packages and um, and just started, like, creating my own uh, style or aesthetic. And uh, I really wanted all my videos to be focused on the film composition, to be focused on my words, too. So I created, like, a this text style where all the words are centered. And it's hard to really describe it. Like, it's, it's more something that you would have to see. But it ended up being cool. Um, uh, objectively speaking, it's really good. And uh, but, that, but that, that, like, that put me on this path of, like, trying to create and 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 trying to make it as as like artistically like i don't even know the right word that i'm trying density that's what i was talking about all these things are really dense like there's a lot in a song and so because sometimes there's so much in what uh in, in the lyrics that i'm trying to uh convey that i can't get out it does help to have a visual experience along with it. And that's the same thing with the art. Like it, sometimes you need like a, oh, I get it now, you know? Yeah, I think um, watching the four that you've released, oh, and this is great, a bar about a bar um, is what we're seeing now. There was so much humor in that, I think. So it was like really, but with the video and yeah. the film and that component like really came out with that and that was like quite enjoyable. So I see what oh, you mean about you. the density. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like the, a bar about a bar is like a song that that's the kind of songs I like to make. So for so many people that never saw that shit, it's a it's a like a one minute long song um, 
that's really not about shit. It's really like it's just rapping for the sake of of, of rapping. It's a it's it's a a bar, a few bars about a bar that I made up in my head. And it doesn't sound as cool, but if you saw it, you'd be like, damn, this nigga can rap. Like, that's how it feels. Yeah. And, but in order to, like, get it to really speak what I'm trying to say and show all of the things that I'm putting together, I needed a visual part of it. And it, and it helped, me, uh, helped me tremendously getting to work on it. That's the animatic. So, like, that's also, like, the, that was, like, the first time I did storyboard. Eh? And, like... There's so many different things that me and the team learned and picked up along the way of like just shooting stuff. Um, and, and then we got to a point where it was like, okay, we can't just shoot stuff. Everything has to be kind of planned out. And now it's like we kind of got it to a T. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that learning process? You know, sort of from the first one to like where you are now saying that y'all like have the process and have it down. Were yeah. there are moments where you're sort of like, oh no, this is not what I think it's going to be? Yeah, I've had, I've had a few moments like that where it wasn't what I wanted to be, and I usually just don't drop that shit. But the everything that came out, I'm like, this is it. Yeah. The I think like the the first video we shot was the Heart and the Tongue. That was on my homie Troy's camera, and uh, I, that was the first time that I played cinematographer and got to like get all the frames together, and like I knew that I wanted this specific composition but you see like this doesn't work so the text is in the is always going to be center of the screen so i have to make sure that i push everything to like the outer thirds or lower or top so that but when i did this video i didn't really understand that so some of the shots work but there's some where like my face is like distracting you from the lyrics and stuff but i learned that over time so the first one was the heart and the tongue we shot that at um my film studio the house of kicks and then the next video after that was i think think was a barb out of oh no it was a child of god so that was when i was talking about with nyla and so this was when i first uh realized that i wanted to do it in collaboration with the artist so i just met her in ghana i think you know a month and a half before and then she flew to chicago and we set her up in the same living room where i shot the heart and the tongue and now you see like i got well, that's like a way better composed shot you know what i mean and and i and i started to work with like you know, lighting and like doing a lot of stuff that I didn't do on the first video a year before. Um, and then I think the next video after that was a bar about a bar. So I, I, uh, I did cinematography on that one, but my homie Troy was the one that directed that one. And then we switched places for a bar, a bar about a bar. I was director on this and he was cinematographer. Um, and yeah, the concept for this was that me and my homie Vic Mensa. Make some noise for Vic Mensa. <laughs> Sorry. This is one of my best friends, so I just wanted to hear some claps. Um, basically, uh, we started doing these writing exercises in 2021 where we would, uh, that we that we started doing, we were like 13 or 14 at, at an after school program, but we brought them back and we basically just go through beats, say yes to one of them, put 10 minutes on the clock, we go in separate rooms, write, come back start over again and then at the end of the day record a bunch of them and a lot of them be raw as hell but they're not like when you go in two different rooms you have you rap about two different things so like they never end up coming out but they all are great raps and i was like oh i gotta you know that i figured that would be a good concept to introduce the bar about a bar thing because it feels like such a writing exercise so um so yeah then i did that one and then we went to venice italy i was just telling you went to the venice biennale um that the 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 piece for that was a uh, was a photograph made by Giannis David Gabenga, who's a photographer from Montreal, I think, or Toronto, Montreal, and uh, and yeah, we flew out to to Italy to try and go get the piece and shoot this video at the fair, but it actually ended up uh, Venice doesn't have a lot of like printing spaces, so we had to go to Paris to get it printed, and. That was awesome. We ended up shooting some stuff in, in Paris. What was really dope about this whole thing or, or deep about it was when we got out there, one of my homies who's a, a, a painter living in Italy, but he linked us in Paris. His name's uh, Thelonious Stokes. Um, he's an amazing artist. You should check out his work. Uh, he was telling us this story about... Um, it was really deep because it really like reflected in the work like unintentionally. Uh, he was telling us about this, this story... Uh, in the 
early 70s. I think it's like 71 or 72. It was like a... Uh, in response to Algerian independence, uh, France had like basically a state sanctioned genocide, like a night where they just like rounded up all these Algerians in Paris and, and drowned them, uh, in the scene, uh, in, in Paris. And it was like the guy who was the head of police that ordered it, like has the main airport in Paris named after him. And this is not a long time ago. Again, like I'm saying, this is like in the seventies, it's like, Muhammad Ali is boxing like it's not a uh, black and white. It's like uh, not that long ago. But we heard this story while we were on this bridge. And I was like, man, if we can shoot something on this bridge, it would be really dope. And I think give some, like you said, agency to some of those uh, people that were, you know, killed in racially motivated murders. And uh so we so we got the piece made in Paris. We made sure that we shot some stuff in Paris that came out really really good. Uh, and then we went to then we went to the to the art fair and and had the greatest time of my life. Connected with so many awesome artists. Created a little clique called the BVA, the Black Venice Alliance, because we had to be like kind of like you know what I'm saying. Like it gets crazy in Italy, so we was like doing like walking home in pairs and shit. Like calling it was like it was a thing. Um, but that was, that was probably like the most, that gave the most form to the project. Cause it got me to be around a bunch of artists and, and that are at the, the top of their field and really get to understand their experience in some of these spaces, some of these festivals, not really fair to them. Like, you know what I'm saying? They'd be the people that get everybody to come out and then they can't get into the after parties and shit. So we threw our own party at the, at, at the fair, uh, uh, all black party at this little hole in the wall bar that we rented out and just had a great time. Shot some video in there too. Like I said, made great friends. And then we went back home and, and debuted the piece at DuSable. And then the last piece that we made was called Ya No, that was in collaboration with Mia Lee. Uh, she's a painter from Chicago. And we shot that over the course of the whole year while we were traveling back and forth between Chicago and Ghana, uh, getting ready for the Black Starline Festival. And it's probably my proudest video. It is really, really long. That's like my one thing that I don't love about it. But like, it's really like, it was really a run and gun video. So we spent so much time learning planimetric symmetry and doing storyboarding and doing all these things to make the videos feel like clean and pristine and like very planned out. And then the, the last video that we did for y'all know was like, like the camera's shaky, There's, it's all natural lighting. Like it's like kind of back to the style of the heart and the tongue, but still done really, really well. Um, that was the longest answer I gave, but as you could tell, I'm, I'm truly passionate about the video stuff. No, I think it's clear. It's also clear watching them and experiencing and listening to them, the passion comes through. And really thinking one of the things that I love about my job working with artists, being a curator is what I learn from them, each project, right? There's something different, the way in which I'm inspired to like really think about something new and how it grows. You know, what are you learning from these visual artists? Like, what is that inspiration like? Uh, it's, it's so much. I think, to be honest, like a couple of years ago, my understanding of blackness was so rooted in my American identity that I didn't really like, I kind of otherized everything that wasn't like black Chicagoan and, and <laughs> straight up, but like getting to getting to like operate in all these other spaces, getting to operate in Italy and Basel, Switzerland and Ghana and Canada and Australia and all these different places and meeting black people and talking to black folks and realizing that there's like it's both sides. It's like they, we are experiencing the same world, but also there's so many things that I've never experienced or that I, I'm not in close enough proximity to, to understand or have empathy for until you meet somebody that's been through it. And, but there's a lot of similarities. I, you know, like a, a lot of artists have like a shaky relationship with galleries or auctions or, you know, uh, dealers or or anything like this i'm a i'm an artist and i'm sure most of you guys that are here know that i'm independent i say it like every day but 
but like I got a shaky relationship with the industry. Like I be looking at them with one eye and shit. Like that's how a lot of artists feel. That's how a lot of visual artists feel. And so getting to just even understand how to work communally with the artist and and never be in a position because I'm so anti-label, right? I'd be like, I never signed anybody, right? And people be telling me I should sign somebody. But I've I have like certain doctrines or understandings that I just always abide by because I feel like that's just my that's just how my brain works. So I don't ever want to be predatory in my dealings. So I I also like thank Nyla for being like She's such a, like, she's still, like, a, she was the first artist I collaborated with, but she's still so um, involved instrumentally and, in, like, helping me make connections with artists, making sure that, uh, that I'm being authentically myself when I'm collaborating and that I'm also platforming the artist yeah. at, at all times. And... Uh, and I forgot what the question was. I don't know why I got Honestly, so Honestly, I don't even know. It's fine. You answered it. I Whatever so. it was, so you did. <laughs> Another thing that I want to make sure that we talk about is the Black Star Line Festival. Yeah. Um, I know there was one earlier this year yeah. in Accra, and you're planning one for next year. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah. So on that first trip to Ghana in January 2022, when I met Nyla and we started, you know, talking about art collabs, we also had like a, a meeting on the beach the last the last day. We went to Labadi, um, which is a beautiful beach in, in Accra, and talked about how much other people should experience this. And we started like fooling around with the idea of doing a festival. Um, and then over the next couple of months, we did a bunch of research on um, uh, the Pan-African Festival of Algiers, um, on the Million Man March, on, on all these different like large scale black communal gatherings and tried to replicate that and and do it for free and do it in Ghana and we ended up doing it it was it was uh it was beautiful that's the best word i can't even think of a better word it was really beautiful um it was 6 days of events uh panels uh art ex uh, art exhibitions uh Dave Chappelle uh spoke at the university uh we had a, a skate show some of the top black pro skaters from the states came in and skated at Freedom Skate Park uh barbecues, all types of stuff. The week, I, I, like, I don't know how to, like, yeah. it was so fun, you know? Um, and then the last day, it, it culminated in a, in a big uh, free concert uh, for about 52,000 people. Uh, people from all over the world, from the States, obviously, but from Canada, from the islands, from the UK, um, from other countries across the continent. Uh, myself, Vic, Erica Badu, T Pain, uh, Jeremiah, Toby and Wigwe, uh, a, a whole bunch of people, and I know I'm forgetting names, but there was a whole bunch of people, and they all came out of the love of their hearts to just come and perform and just be a part of this big gathering, and it was really like one of the most beautiful things I ever seen, and and really couldn't have been done without the the teamwork, the people around me, and. And, li and, and literally God, because I didn't think it was going to work out. There were many times where I was like, this shit is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But it worked. Uh, we started a little bit late. It went till 7 a.m. But people stayed out there with us. And we it was, again, the most beautiful, stressful day of my life. Yeah. Uh, and so you're going to do it again. And so we're going <laughs> to do it again. Uh, next year, uh, 2024, we're taking it. On the road, we're going to Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, yeah, that sounds good to people in Miami. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, so, so the Black Star Line, right? The the title of my project, Star Line Gallery. Uh, the title of the festival, the Black Star Line. It's all in, in homage to, uh, partially in, in homage to Marcus Garvey. Um, and for those that don't know, Marcus Garvey in the 1920s. Uh, started a shipping company called the Black Star Line. He owned uh, three or four huge ocean liner ships that were to uh, develop and create trade between the the U.S. and the Caribbean islands and South America and eventually, hopefully, Africa. Uh, but it was 
shut down and he was framed for uh, for mail fraud by the U.S. government. But it was a huge deal. Like when this happened, this is like 1920, 1919 through 1921. And got a whole bunch of people jobs it started becoming a passenger ship so it took a couple of people that like weren't able to get on uh the white star line which is what owned the titanic and a bunch of other ships uh it it, it made people travelers and it was like a, a symbol of hope in this time when like black capitalism was like a new idea and like there were like all these things that like like just the idea of being radical was like was was kind of like on the up and up and Marcus Garvey was the loudest voice you know he wasn't always right I'm not a Marcus Garvey apologist but like you know he he was definitely the loudest and he was getting that money so I fuck with Marcus Garvey my great-grandfather was a Garveyite and my grandmother had given me all this history right before I went to Ghana for my first trip so when I got there and Nyla took me to the Kwame Nkrumah mausoleum uh which is where the the first president of of Ghana is buried I learned a lot of history about him, and it turned out that uh, Kwame Nkrumah studied at an HBCU in the States before returning to Ghana, and learned about Marcus Garvey and about uh, this global blackness and, and creating, because that was a big part of Marcus's message was, was creating a, an alliance of black people around the world, and he considered himself an African. And so when Kwame Nkrumah learned this stuff, he, became radicalized, and he came back to Ghana and freed them from uh, British imperialism and, 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 and basically founded the first, like, pan-African country. Like, he, he, to this day, Ghana is so rooted in, like, bringing black people back to, through the gates, is what they call it. It's the gateway. And, uh, you know, they got the Black Star in their flag. They have Black Star Square as their national, like, political space. Like, they're very, they're very on that, you know what I'm saying? So like, when I learned that, it just felt like a, like a, a whole thing that was supposed to happen. And so, I again forgot the question that I was answering. Just you were I telling us about the festival. So the festival. You got the, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. So, obviously, it made sense to do it in Ghana first, uh, but now we're gonna take it back to where the UNI, when the UNIA still operates, where Freedom Hall is, where all of this. This education that we need to do on ourselves uh, is widely accessible and, and create a space, a safe space for people to come and enjoy themselves, but also get some education, have some good dialogue, communicate in, in, in confidence, and, and, and yeah, and turn up, I guess. Yeah. Um, so my last question before we open it up to the audience is really you know, thinking about 2023 was a big year for you. Like we have um, obviously this festival and then the 10th anniversary of Acid Rap. So really, what are you looking forward to the most in 2024? If I'm being honest, the thing I'm looking forward the most to is dropping some music. Uh, well, thank you for the snaps. <laughs> thank you for the snaps. Cause it is poetic. Yeah. No, it's so, it's so good. And the other day, <laughs> the other day I was in Orlando, uh, cause I don't know how many people in here are recording artists, but like when you make a song, it goes one of two ways. It goes one of two ways. Y you either don't really feel it like that in the beginning and then over time it grows on you or you love it when you first create it. And over time you kind of lose, you know, you get used to it, you hear it all the time. And the best feeling is when you get to link up with artists and play your music for them for the first time, uh, because then it it makes your ears feel fresh too. You start to think about all the things that you forgot about and all the little metaphors or like the the beat changing or whatever and shit like that. So I went to I went to Orlando right before I came out here and I linked up with the legendary Dark Child, uh, Rodney Jerkins who's one of my favorite producers of all time. Um, he made you rock my world, so go to it, you feel yeah. me? I mean, among so many other hits, he made stuff for Brandy, Monica, Whitney, Destiny's Child. Um, but I've been trying to, to work with him and link with him for like four years. And when I first hit him up, he was really wanting to link, but I didn't really have any anything in the 
arsenal. Like I was still like fresh and years and years went by of him trying to make the connection over and over again. And it just wasn't working out. And it happened at the perfect time that he happened to be in Orlando. Yeah, so I, I linked up with Dark Child, and Dark Child liked my music. I played some new music for Dark Child, and he was fucking with it, and he said it was good. So make sure y'all stay tuned for that Starline coming next year. Thank you. <laughs> So despite that amazing warning, we still have time for a couple of questions. And there are microphones that will be passed around. So raise your hand, and um, someone will bring you a mic. Hey, what's up, Chance? Yo. Uh, I just want to say thank you for everything you've contributed to music and hip hop and rap. Like, I got so many great memories with my homies chilling in a car, listening to acid rap, coloring book. So thank you. Yo, thank you. Um, but I just wanted to ask, like, seeing the passion that you have for film and, like, film composition, I know for me, one of my, one of my favorite films, if not my most favorite, is A Bronx Tale, um, just because of the way Robert De Niro just captured, like, all the characters in the scenes. Um, so I kind of want to hear from you, like, kind of a hard question, but what's a film that you really love, your favorite film, or one that truly, like, inspires you? Wow, that's such a good question. I have so many favorite films. I'm going to just list some of them, and then one of them I'm probably going to stop on and say, this is why. So I love Drumline. That's, a, that's an amazing, amazing film. It's so slept on, but it's in the pantheon of great films, period. Uh, I love every Wes Anderson film. That's who, I, that's who I'm biting. If y'all was like, this looks familiar, this flat composition, that's because that's I love Wes uh, Anderson. And... Uh, my favorite film, I'm not going to lie, I still watch this movie all the time, but a lot of people don't really like this. Has anybody ever seen a movie called The Brothers Bloom? <laughs> no one's seen it. It's so good, though. It's so good. It's, we'll all go uh, watch it now. Sorry, y'all. Well, it exists, trust me. Uh, it's, a, it's a movie with Mark Ruffalo and... Uh, oh, shit, what's his name? Damn. Oh, I can't even remember. He was the youngest guy to win... <laughs> the academy award you guys don't know this trivia shit either what's his name adrian brody adrian brody um and it's a it's a heist film but it's like super meta it's ryan johnson who's also one of my favorite directors he does the knives out stuff he did brick he did uh he did a lot of movies he's just a great writer and i just love the adventure of it that's what i'm starting to get to like when i was a kid i really really loved plot twist films like m night Shyamalan stuff but those don't have a lot of like Replay value, you know what I'm saying? Like it's like once you know it, and it's like okay, I you got me the first time. <laughs> but there's, <laughs> but I like epics now. I love adventure tales. I love movies where I, I love stylized dialogue. Like I love Quentin Tarantino movies and Spike Lee. They feel like the, kind of the same person to me because there's so much just random dialogue that doesn't matter to the plot. Um, I don't know. I don't. I wish I didn't say that was my favorite movie. I feel so lame. No one's ever seen that movie. <laughs> Uh, but we're all going to go watch it. Yeah. Don't worry. Everyone's going to go sure home and watch it. No, you should, though. It's called The Brothers Bloom. It's by Ryan Johnson. Like, <laughs> write it down. Go see it if you get some time. Yeah. <laughs> Another question? Oh, yes. Hi, I'm Aries. Um, I'm also a multimedia visual artist. So I find that, like, in my everyday life, I always, like, wear my art. I carry my art with me because it's who I am. I'm even wearing it right now. I did this last night, you know, so it's just like Fire. those spontaneous moments. And I feel inspired just hearing you talk about the art of creating. So I wanted to ask you, as you partake in these different like artist perspectives, do you find your music and what you're about and your background bleeds into their work as well? Yeah. Uh, usually, for example, like uh, there was a piece that we did called Y'all Know. It was the video that we shot in Ghana. And... Mia painted that piece, and we did that one really, really quickly. Like, that was, like, one of the ones that, I don't want to say it felt forced, but it was, like, I knew that I, I knew the video concept, and I knew the beat. We made the beat, like, a long time before I finished the raps. But I knew, like, I'm going to shoot a video to this beat. I'm going to shoot it in Ghana. It's going to promote the festival. It's going to be all these different cities. And uh, my story of... Migration, that was kind of like the the conversation that got to the to the piece, y'all know. It was about, I was talking about how my, my grandparents came up from Alabama, Alabama and Georgia, 
uh, to Chicago in the 30s and like how there were so many stories that probably never got shared. Like I just found out that on both sides of my family and this is like past the statute of limitations, both sides of my family, somebody killed a white man and they had to like go to another town and change their last name. But like on my mom's side and on my dad's side, like a generation apart. And, like, <laughs> and they just like, I got told both of those stories on, um, from my mom and from my grandmother on my dad's side in the same year. And I was just telling her that shit. We was just really joking about it, like t talking about how much stuff we didn't know. And she was telling me that her great grandfather uh, came from Rotan, which is a, a mostly black skinned, Spanish speaking people in, in I think it's in Central America. It's near Honduras. So she was telling me that uh, that her family from, I think it was on her dad's side of the family, migrated up from even further south. And we were just talking about how motherfuckers made that trip. Like, everybody didn't have, you know what I'm saying, SUVs and shit. Like, it was tough to get to, to Chicago. And... <laughs> But this story that we that these like these jokes that we were telling the story that we were telling back and forth ended up being kind of told in the piece that she created and it's and it's a a man and a woman uh or this is at least how I perceive it it's a man and a woman standing in front of what looks like a like a a either a burning house or what I see is like a burning vehicle and it's like about them carrying this smile as they continue to move forward and not really worried and about you know the dumpster fire in the back. That's how I perceive it. I don't even remember what Mia told me about it. But she's an amazing artist. And this was just an example of my personal life and experience uh, coming across in, in her work. And because she painted this, that's what gave me the last three verses. I told you it's a really long song. The the There's a four-verse song, but the second, third, and fourth verse came to me easier than the first one did because I had this conversation with Mia. Thank you. So I think we have time for one last question in the front. Yes. Good evening, Chance, Good Lauren, evening. everyone. First, thank you guys for this opportunity. Uh, amazing. Can we give them a round of applause? I enjoy it myself. You guys gave us some great information. Uh, my name is Ebony Walls, Midwestern Detroit. Um, and representing Be A Part Of Me Consulting, I want to ask you a question more so on um, a curating philanthropy side. I'm a sports philanthropist with the Star Gallery. Have you ever thought about maybe taking this on the road? So Howard did an amazing uh, fundraiser two nights ago, the Chroma exhibit with Ben, and the pieces that they're selling from local artists from all over the world, they're going to invest the money back into Howard University. As president of the Alumni Association, I'm plugging Eastern Michigan <laughs> University. Is that something that you'd be interested in working with these amazing artists all over the world, collectively and communal, raising money to invest in the new artists coming up that's currently in school, maybe not in school, but maybe want to learn more about the arts in the industry? Absolutely. Uh, and how do I get in touch with you after this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So here's the thing. And I didn't really properly explain this. So what I do with these collaborations is that the piece that gets created, this tangible piece, I take a photo of it, right? And that photo becomes the representation of the song in flat format. But really, the painting itself is still the actual piece, right? And that actual piece throughout the whole process belongs to the artist. So when it goes into the museum, the artist has to sign off on it being in the museum. When I, if, if it ever gets shown, I have to contact the artist and see if they're willing to show. And if they want to sell, that's completely up to them. So I, me personally, I love doing uh, fundraisers and, and, and auctions. I think it would be a conversation I would have to have with like 16 different artists and be like, hey, are you down uh, to do it? And I think most of them would. I, I'm really interested in the idea. I think it would be something dope. I think right now the goal for the pieces is to do a traveling show um, and, and like a tour of the pieces with like a really cool experience. And I, I'm pretty sure that's how we're going to debut the project. Um, but in that vision, it's not really for sale. It's more like, a you know, come and check it out, come and experience it. Um, but I think that that's, that's something that I could help outside of these actual pieces.
like just curating a show of artists that want to work on it or do new pieces for an auction is something that I'd be super interested in. Thank you. I just needed a slow yes instead of a fast no. So that good. There you go. That was, a, that was the slowest yes possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so thank much you, for Lauren. this, and thank all of you for being here. Please, round of applause for Lauren for these amazing questions. And for you guys, thank y'all so much.